So welcome everybody to the Martin Siegel Theatre Center here, the Graduate Center CUNY, and thank you for waiting a couple of more minutes. Uh, some uh, people are late, also supporters from the National Black Theatre who helped us. But I think we're now going to go and start. My name is Frank Henschker, and the director of the Martin Siegel Theatre Center, and together with Antje Ögel, who is my co-director of programs, Antje, who's here, we prepared this, uh, what we think will be an extraordinary um, evening celebrating um, the art and culture, life and spiritual forces of Yoruba, it's a fantastic project that was developed by the Royal Court and the Young Vic, and we have with us Elise Dugnison, who is the um, uh, mentor of the project. She coordinated um, and all the five players. She will tell a little bit more about the project, just for you to know she runs a program that is actually legendary in the world for over 25 years. She uh, creates, run, runs, and, um, and develops the International Writers Program of the Royal Court. I think it is without any equals around the globe and it has done so much for for the world of theater, the global world and for an understanding. So it's a really big, big honor to have you here. She flew in from London to be with us and also to make sure we do it right. <laughs> and uh, and we did, I hope. So uh, again, thank you for coming. And she will say a very few words, um, then our director will say uh, some introductory words. The reading will be about 85 to 90 minutes. And there will be a little panel discussion here. You don't have to stay, but if you want, you come here. Then after the discussion, as a reward, is a little reception in case you're still here for longer. And it is uh, some wine, but I don't think you all um, can get it. So, uh, uh, But we have water and pretzels, and that's, uh, that's exciting. So now is the moment. If you have a cell phone, take it out, and I'll do the same. And make sure it is off. Sound of, yeah, is it? Oops, yeah. Okay, all that. So again, thank you uh, for coming, especially in this busy time about the holidays. We need great theater, but we also really do need a good and great audience. So it means a lot uh, for us that you come here. And I hope you will um, see uh, the world a little bit differently whenever it comes to Yoruba and uh, after, after the evening. Uh, Elise, give us a little. Just a little. Um, <coughs> This project started in 2007, more or less, because by sheer coincidence, we were working, as Frank says, we worked with writers all over the world, and we had a project in Nigeria, we had another one in Cuba, and we had another one in Brazil. And I always say the project started on a, a beach in Lagos, where some of the writers said, where are you going next? And I said, oh, well, we have a long-term project in Cuba. And they said, oh, no, no, you must tell us about our religion in Cuba, Santeria. And then it moved on with the writers in Brazil actually asked if I could bring some soil from Nigeria to them. And we did all of that. And it took many years, but by 2010, we had the young Vic on board and the director, Rufus Norris, and by 2013, we produced Feast at, at, at the Young Vic. And uh, it's absolutely thrilling to see it having a further life here. So thank you. Hey, everybody. How are you guys doing? Great. Good. Thank you so much for being here. We have been working a little bit last night and most of today 
uh, to present a little taste of this amazing play for you. So what you're gonna see is a staged reading of this piece to bring to life um, a, a little bit of what uh, the production was in London a couple years ago. There's music and projections and a little bit of dance and some amazing actors, but mostly I just wanted to say thank you for being here and enjoy Beast. Okay, Ori. 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 Ori, the inner head. The entire Yoruba culture comes down to Ori. See, your, your, your inner head who you really are, whether you know it or not, the whole of this universal belief system comes down to this concept, Ori. Your life's work is to know your Ori and live by it. Know you and be you and do you, whatever it is. It's beautiful. So, um, thank you all uh, for, um, for staying and, uh, uh, and uh, first of all, I think um, Agoye is the director, but also the actors uh, deserve really another round of applause. Um, maybe I ask Elise first, um, what comes to your mind when you see the New York one day rehearsal of a project you worked over for a year in the UK. Uh, just amazing. <laughs> and to see your, your responses uh, uh, is, is, is really just shows how this story works everywhere. Tell us a little bit more about the original idea. It's such an unusual uh, uh, a project. Tell us a little bit, you mentioned it, but um, you, how did it work and with what countries, what playwrights, how, how do you coordinate the... Well, we we had we had playwrights um, originally from the three countries that we'd been working on in this project: Nigeria, Cuba, and Brazil. But we decided to bring in the United States, uh, and because there were so many great writers we could work with, and because we know that there's you know, that th this is really related. And of course, how could we do that and not bring in the UK as well? And there's a huge Europe. Of culture there. So we, in the end, we knew we would go for five writers, but uh, the original project had probably, oh, between 15 and 20 writers from all of those countries coming over uh, to London on two occasions. It should have been more, but we couldn't always aff afford it, and working together in this workshop with Rufus Norris and, and myself and uh, musicians. We had a Cuban choreographer. Um, and we had uh, Shola Akimbole who, who did the music and, and M Michael Henry so uh, uh, from Britain um, and over a period of time we had to hone it down to the five writers so Brazil was Marcus Barbosa Cuba was Junior Aguilera um, the UK um, uh, was Bolahan um, and uh, the, the U.S. was Tanya Barfield, which is a shame because she's in L.A., so, so, so she's not here. Um, and I forgot one. Oh, Nigeria was Rotsumi Babatunde. So in the end, those were the five writers. And, of course, in weaving the stories, the actors and the director all you know, managed to, to put that together, too. What did you discover in the process of developing the project that surprised you that you um, 
I think almost the same thing that surprised me today, that, there's, that there are just some forces working um, in this story that's sort of beyond any of us and that touches all of us. Um, I, it very specifically touches the journey that w w was made um, and, the, the, and, and the cultures that have been so deeply affected and have had such a, an effect on other cultures. But I think uh, anyone who sees this work uh, really respects uh, how much of this story is, is part of them. I saw that here. Yeah, we saw. Thank you. Rufus, by the way, is now became the director of the National Theatre in London. So um, that is also so quite... His, his god, his Orisha, is a shossi who has one arrow but always gets a bullseye. So. <laughs> that, that is amazing. How was, as the last question, how was the re audience reaction in London? How long was the run? T tell us the space where it was done. Um, it was at the Young Vic, a beautiful theatre in the main house. And the res and it was uh, the audience was uh, w was absolutely packed and full and lively and participating. You can imagine, um, you know, there was lots of uh, opportunity to participate. So it was absolutely joyful, as as well as being a very deep and and profound and tragic story as well. Thank you, Avoye. Um, we asked you some time ago, but not too long ago, when to 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 put your teeth into this. Uh, apple of a, that uh, of a play. Um, what was your experience? It's been it's been amazing. It's been such a, a whirlwind. I mean, for me, the thing I was so excited about is you know I feel like we're in this moment in history where we we get to kind of put pieces together that feel like they've spent centuries getting torn apart. So it's really exciting to be able to think about Yoruba culture, West African culture, African culture as a large and where the bonds between Africa and the rest of the world have been maintained, you know? And I mean, it's so, the kind of classic example of what this means to put everything together, I mean, we're having rehearsal today, and Larry, our amazing musician, Max, who's our amazing uh, tap dancer who studied Afro-Cuban music, but who's from Austria, and then our dancer who's from Cuba, we're rehearsing, and she started doing a dance, which is a, a legba's dance, and both of them just started singing a legba song, and they just created this amazing music together. They've never met each other before. They come from three different countries, but there is something that unites all, all of them. So it's been fun to kind of see where all those pieces are and to bring in these amazing actors, many of whom are Nigerian, uh, some of whom are American, and just kind of see what all those kind of connections and fusions are. So it's been fun, yeah. And um, do, do you have a personal connection also to Yoruba, or you do, how do you know? You know, it's so interesting. I mean, for me, what's been great is I also get to learn. So my family's from Ghana, and but it's so interesting because as, as I was talking to uh, a Nigerian Yor Yoruba scholar the other day, um, like my my family, my name is from the Ewe tribe in Ghana, which kind of spreads from Ghana to Togo to Benin, which kind of sits on the border of where uh, Yoruba is also. So there's like even just linguistically these kind of connections, even though it's not my particular um, cultural religion or anything like that. So for me, it's been a, also a great learning experience too. You know, I mean, I think there's a lot of things within our larger continental African culture that we can all connect to, but um, learning about the different Orishas and the gods and all these kinds of things that I've been learning for years to be able to bring that all together now has been cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so very often what we see uh, in New York is, in quotation marks, the well-made British play. There's a beginning and an end, and people sit around a table, and then they talk and things. This is so different mm -hmm. in the structure. I mean, the way it's a collage, perhaps the great art form coming out of the 20th century. But how do, how do you feel? Does the work go theatrically and uh, the dramaturgy of it? Um, will, would audiences uh, respond to this here? What What is your... I feel, I feel like actually people can respond to it almost sometimes even more deeply when things are set up in vignettes than when they're set up in a narrative through line just because the way that we talk and we think and we remember the way that we have memory is not linear, you know what I mean? So it's really, I feel like all of these vignettes, it's about us capturing the spirit of each of those vignettes and 
letting those things live together. But I think that that kind of floaty nature of it, that feeling of, oh, this thing is present, but it's also ancient. Those two things are living with each other at the same time. So I feel like in a way it feels almost more natural than structuring everything linearly. It's like, it's just our being in a way. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I do. And I do like the archaeology of the project. It really feels like there was some digging uh, over centuries and, and taking things out. And the temporality that actually perhaps life and life force are not linear, like one, this one dies, and this. Maybe it is a circle. Maybe things are connected. And, you know, there is no, you know, history of theater. It's sort of was the Greek, and then there was a time, nothing, and then the French and the Germans, and then Dada and this, and then Persian. You know, playwriting, maybe, you know, there is something um, that connects us all on a, on, a, on a level, and especially, of course, this project. So it really um, uh, uh, made, me, made, me, made me think of... Uh, the ways how that sort of temporality of the modernity or, or of a culture and this archaeology could be brought on a stage in such a lively, li lively matter, and I thought it is quite, um, quite uh, inspiring to see, and uh, it also perhaps a model for mm -hmm. projects about many, many other subjects, about many other cultures, because there could be the case made. This is what if it works here, it could work for others, and perhaps it is a playwriting of a 21st uh, century to go away from the one author and to collage material and still have a dramaturgy. Um, Shade, thank, thank you. Did you just discover that Western culture isn't the only form no, the of linear high form. art? No, 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 no. Oh. Actually, we do a lot oh. here. Um, no, 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 But yeah, what yeah. I just mean is that what you articulated beautifully yeah. is um, the drumbeat of indigenous cultures around the world. We have been expressing ourselves um, from an indigenous point of view that has been powerful and that has created, you know, transcontinental languages and rituals and ways of understanding and being that have sustained this globe. And I think that it's brave and exciting that this piece is brought here because what we can see is that this, and it's reflective of what's happening in the world right now, right? these kind of the coming down of walls, the coming down of colonial thinking, of linear thinking, ways to rethink our well-being and our holistic care of each other comes from these non-linear kind of indigenous ritualistic um, cultures and languages that tip the kind of the, the, the mainstream art world on its head and creates possibilities for what can be, which is so exciting, you know? And like now more than ever in this day and age, how exciting to have something where you can recontextualize something as um, traditional as uh, the derivation of some of the institutions that brought this here with this wonderful folkloric stories that kind of are a quilt of uh, indigenous culture. So what, what was your reaction to the story, watching it and seeing it? Um, my reaction, that's an interesting question. I will just say this. You know, National Black Theater was founded in 1968, so we kind of tackle a bit of that time period. And what we were committed to when my mother founded the theater was ritualistic theater. She didn't believe in the fourth wall. She didn't believe in art for art's sake, right? So she believed that our purpose for creating art was to create dialogue, to create healing within our communities. And you couldn't do that if you didn't tell your stories from your purview, from your PO view. And, and that if black folks in particular were going to find any liberation in a country that brought them here enslaved, we had to have a past that did not begin at our enslavement. And so that the natural connection would be to the continent. Now, the continent is huge, right? Why Yoruba? Um, and so what I found to be about this piece in particular that was so interesting, what kept popping up for me, and Oye, you did an amazing job, was that Yoruba culture was like the Underground Railroad, right? This common language spoken on transcontinental 
in transcontinental ways that created a common language hidden by Catholicism, by colonialism, by all of these things, but its point of preservation was liberation. And we see that from the 1700s to today in this play. And so for me, that was remarkable to be able to kind of trace through narrative um, this journey of our liberation um, by any means necessary. The play did start in the 1700s. You came, I think, a, yeah. a couple of minutes late, but so it is a truly, an, mm -hmm. yeah, a, 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 a quite um, a remarkable a way of storytelling. Um, so would that be a play, would you think, that, that could be put on? What do you, what do you think? Would, would people come in New York? Uh, did it have to be changed? Uh, well, who could put this on? Or is that something um, that is better suited for London? No, no, I mean, so that's the thing. We've been doing Yoruba plays since time immemorial, like since the beginning. If you come to the theater, all of our walls are created with art that tells the folklore of Yoruba. Who's, it, who's uh, the playwright who's uh, in the blue and brown waters? Uh, Terrell. 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 So he's so doing your yeah story. he's doing Yoruba stories. So for so can it be done? Yes. Has it been done since for you know for centuries? Um, now who's the audience, and how do you turn on an audience, a traditional theater audience, to something that may feel less traditional. I think that's the key, but will it work as theater? Yeah. It worked mm -hmm. tonight, it's worked for the last 50 years that we've been doing it, it continues to work in modern playwrights, and I'm sure what you found with all the playwrights that you worked with, that it was an incredible experience that really translated to audiences. But finding the audience that can really appreciate not only the cultural references, but the power of what you were describing in Nonlinear ways to perform and look at theater. I think that's what we have to figure out completely. Um, any more comment people? Maybe we open up to some questions, but some I, more. I, I think that I mean I think one of the things that's really tremendous about this piece that Shade is. Can you hold uh, a bit closer. Yeah. That Shade is kind of touching on as well is is about where do sto where do stories get told and how do those stories get told? So for example, the work that NBT has been doing for the past 50, 48 years. 48 years now is all about how to tell stories about black people from around the diaspora. I think the thing that's really exciting about um, the piece is it's these, these stories are stories that we hear. I mean, I'm first generation American. It's like when I hear them arguing around the dinner table, it's like that's that's a, that's a story I know. It's like I understand that that dichotomy of existing kind of also between two cultures. It's very familiar. It's, it's so then it's not about is it understandable or relatable or accessible, but more about where are all these stories going to get told, not that they are. Um, difficult to understand, but who is getting to hear these stories and where, where are the stories getting told? And I think that in a place also where we are, as a country, figuring out how to rewrite narratives, how to rewrite the narratives of who we are in kind of our popular culture, we have to take all of the core of who we are and make sure all the stories are getting told so that we can make sure that we're telling a correct and true narrative of who we are. You know what I mean? Well, good, thank you. I, I think that's, that is true, and also your, your comments, and to see where is the audience. But it also might bring in an audience, a new audience, and, uh, mm -hmm. and another one. So I can't wait to see, to see that. And I wish we, I had a little uh, magic pad. I said, here's <laughs> enough money. Do it. Work three months on it. I think it would be a sensational uh, production, actually, I do think. It's beautiful. Quite a landmark uh, play, and that could be maybe even variations. I think written again, mm -hmm. you know. Right now, so yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> another one. So um, that is that is going to bring you back. Uh, um, Elise is uh, actually a Brooklyn girl, right? And um, and now since twenty five years at the Royal Court in London. But um, maybe some comments or questions from the audience. I'm impressed. I think that would be very meaningful for Elise and for the director and for you to hear um, some. Um, uh, it's a, it's a great project, uh, but th there is a little trap. I mean, it's too early to 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 see if you are gonna fall on the trap. But it's kind of like a view of like the African identity from outside. So it's kind of like a 
and and you know kind of like um, a, a colonial view of African culture. So I was so so my question that the segue is: Do you plan to do other projects? Let's say for let's say East African um, uh, languages and stories and South African and you know because Africa I think it's not I think it's it's kind of like a, a, a colonial view that it's like this one unique like block but it's very diverse and very profound and very diverse and is the project gonna go there or you're gonna stay with uh, with uh, Yoruba people. Thank you. Um, I I think I just want to say that I call all of this work told from the inside, not from the outside, and that all of the writers were telling it from their own experience, which was mostly inside the culture. Um, but yes, to answer your question, we work all, all over the world, and we've just had an incredible project in South Africa um, with, with 12 writers working in many different languages. And, and also, we actually started our work 25 years ago uh, in, U in Uganda and East Africa. Um, so th this isn't telling the story of, of Africa. It's telling a very specific story. But we always say the more specific, the more universal it, I, it becomes. I'm just yeah. curious why you thought it was not in any kind of why, why, what felt colonial about it. I mean, I don't know about the, the, the project, but I, you know, I, I, I didn't know if there were more languages, like. Oh, that they were speaking English. Is that no, what you mean? no, 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 no. The like picking Yorumba and then and then making the connections, like the, the Nigerian connections, let's say with with Brazil and Cuba. While you know, why, why Nigeria? It could be like other places. Well, that's the that's no, the that's the seat of the Yoruba is in Nigeria, so. You can go to Oshogbo, to the bush, go to the Oshun groves. I mean, it is this. It is the seat of Yoruba culture worldwide is in Nigeria, uh, and it has roots and diasporics um, reach, reaches out throughout the continent and throughout Brazil, Cuba, America, Nice. In, you, so uh, yeah, but, but maybe let's go. You had it one, and then two, and then three. Then four, maybe yes. So, um. Thank you. So that was definitely a provocative question. I'm tempted to answer that, but um, but I think that more people have things to say. Um, I I want to say you know that I, I really enjoyed the play. So you know I think everybody who was involved in it. Um, I'm a graduate student here in urban education, um, and I'm particularly interested in linguistics. So I I saw myself reflected throughout it. Um, I'm also an initiated priestess in Haitian Voodoo. Um, so I'm looking at it and I'm seeing myself reflected. I'm seeing the, um, what, what I call, you know, in, there's translanguaging happening, there's trans-dialecting happening um, that I can relate to growing up in New York City, being African American, you know, being growing up in, you know, Brooklyn, New York, Flatbush, Brooklyn, where there's all kinds of, you know, um, multi, there's a multi-ethnic black identity, you know, throughout New York City and then particularly in those areas. So when I think about, you know, in terms of the audience, I think, wow, how wonderful would it be for youth, particularly in New York City, to be able to be exposed to that. So the children who were here, you know, it was, you know, they were a little bit young for some of the content, you know, um, <laughs> you know, but for, I think from, you know, for more, for more mature, you know, audience for high school, I think that it's, it's, it's crucial to have this kind of work because it's speaking to their experience. It's speaking to that you know, to that third space, right, that you were talking about, you know, the, you know, kind of third world, third culture children, right, it's speaking to that identity. So I think it's really important. Um, and then I also want to say that as I was watching it, I was thinking about, you know, um, I'm not too, too much read up on it, but I was thinking about Veve Clark, thinking about literary theory, and I was thinking about, you know, Veve, Veve Clark's idea of, um, of, 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 dial no, what is it, it's um, diasporic literacy, Right, so it's a, something that I'm really interested in. This idea that you know that you're interpreting that there's certain you know um, certain forms, right? Certain folklore forms, certain you know um, forms of expression that you know that it's critical. You have to have this kind of diasporic um, 
perspective in order to translate it, in order to understand it. You know, so it could because it's not rooted in one tradition, but it's something that kind of happens. It's like this creolization, right, that happens with with language, with expression, with identity. And so that's what was running through my mind, you know, is this, wow, we really need more of this um, diasporic literacy. We need more text. We need more, um, you know, uh, just, you know, more forms of literary expression that, that reflects that. Because so many children, I'm, you know, I grew up in the 80s, and, you know, forget about it now. These children who are growing up now, it's even more so. So I think that a play like this is, is something that more accurately reflects their lived experiences. So I think that, you know, that it, it'll really take off in other you know, really throughout, wherever you, you know, wherever you have black people, it's going to take off, you know, um, and then I think other people will be able to connect to it too, but I'm particularly interested in the children. Thank you, <laughs> yeah, thank you. What was number two? Was that? Yes. Thank you. Sereme, Witu Gunyo, Kusungu Bay, Gunyonle. I'm speaking Garifuna. It's a, a language that my ethnic group from where I come from uh, speaks still and we strictly connected with uh, Yoruba, of course, because uh, the Africans from where we descend came to St. Vincent, the Grenadines, where they mix with Caribbean and other indigenous people, Arawaks, and we are the results and here and still uh, my, my people still lives in Central America where we develop and still fighting. Something that is very important, I really appreciate of this play, is the fact that it's not resolved. What I mean by that is that you just pick yourself and identify yourself with that because you're looking everybody very well defined, mm -hmm. but because you go deep into the spiritual part and you have to find yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a very important thing for us to connect mm -hmm. and not forget uh, the aspect the aspect that really holds us. Mm -hmm. Shade, that's your name, yeah. you mentioned something that really strikes me very much, is that you said that uh, in order to identify yourself, um, we have to, to go to, to all the uh, aspects of the Yoruba tradition, the religion aspect, and I find that in us, and it's important in order to be strong in this actual time in 21st century, we need to connect mm -hmm. and to connect with our identity. And that force, also I saw it in, in the representation of dif different uh, deities, is that we as a woman, we represent that. And we need to connect with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm um, of course, an academic and an Africanist, and my work is exactly this. I begin in Yoruba land, and I go all over, and I spend my summers between Nigeria, um, Brazil, Cuba, and the South. And I'm writing, my next book is actually on dramaturgy and on literature and the connections in all of these using the Yoruba paradigms. So I'm very interested in finding out if there's a text you know, written text that I could use because I already have the paper in my head <laughs> that I'm going to there write. There is a text, yes. Yeah? And yes. where I can get it. And also, I would love to speak to you more because I work with an Afro-Brazilian uh, theater group in Brazil, Bando de Teatro Oldum. And oh, they're well, doing... In, in Salvador. In Salvador, they, they've yeah. They've been, uh, you know, one of the groups that have been involved in this yeah, project. Yeah, and I was, yeah. this is like, this is exactly what they would do and, okay. you know, kind of like bringing that stuff, you know, bringing it all together, you know, and I'm working on translations of the Bando's work, so, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, this is really um, bringing all the work full circle and I congratulate you on this. It's uh, wonderful. Tell us a bit, what did you see in the play when you watched it? What I, I, well, definitely the connections. And the way that the deities are expressed all across the, you know, in the different realms. And even the fact that at the very end you brought in Shango, like, well, you brought back to Trinidad and, you know, I immediately thought of the Trinidadian Baptists, 
you know, and, and then, of course, the white priest who's initiated. There's a whole new layer of phenomena that's coming out in the African world. And so it's like, it, and of course, Asese, you know, Yemoja, the songs and everything, that's, those songs are very pan-African, pan-diasporic. They're, they're songs that are very particular, but those songs in particular that you use, you find them everywhere, everywhere you go and you travel. That's, those are the, those are the, like, the essential songs, yeah. you know? So there's so much, everything is there. And the characteristics of the deities, it's all there, you know? I have to say, I love the white babalao because one, you know, you see more and more of it, and it's always when you walk into a room, <laughs> like. <laughs> but then when you think about it, too, like, um, one of, so my head is Yemaya, um, and one of the places that I was raised was in the Oshun Groves in Oshogbo. And if you've ever been, it's a UNESCO sacred site, and it's all carved with new sacred artwork. And the mother of the grove is a German woman, right, Susan Wenger, who passed away a few years ago, but she was a Oshun priestess, and the work, the artwork that has come out of Nigeria for the last however long, she was really the foremother of protecting and making sure that that work got into the world and preserved, and so I love that, mm -hmm. even that bridge. Mm -hmm. Well, really quick, well, um, I'm working basically like in, in this genre as well, but I'm just starting into it. Um, but from a dance perspective, yes. And I'm going to do a project this, this coming like spring. So it was like, that's why I came out to see it. So I really appreciate this is going on. And I would love it, like the text as well. Um, but first, I want to say that this particular format of nonlinear storytelling kept me present. Mm. So it was very, like, like what she said, it, that the children could really relate to it because it keeps you so present, you don't have to think about the past. And you're thinking about the past, you're thinking about your present, you're thinking about your future. And that, and that, that nonlinear thinking actually like affords us that and like lets us be able to create from this moment because it keeps us right here in the moment, like while it's happening, as opposed to thinking like things are happening in this timeline, but things are happening mm -hmm. and right now. So that, that, was, that was really appreciated. But I have a very specific question. <laughs> um, it deals with the, um, the, like toward the end, the last text um, when the, the white Baba Lao came, right? And when he spoke at the end. So I was thinking, okay, I would love to know, like have a translation for what he was saying to him. So that was the only part where I was like, okay, I was just very curious. Like I, I got the point, mm -hmm. but then I also wanted to know, like think what was like, being said. Think about it like opera. Half the time you don't know what they're saying, but you can feel it, you know? Um, and I think it's powerful that the, Yor the, yeah, the Yoruba language was being spoken. One of the plays that we developed through our playwright residency was in Abibio, 30% of it was in Abibio. So you, oh, the opening scene is two Nigerian women at JFK airport speaking their native language. And the playwright who's a Ghanaian, um, no, Nigerian, first generation Nigerian, she, made sure that 30% was done in the BBO because, because this is what I thought you were getting at, was Africa is not a country, it's a continent. And the tongue of our people is varied, and we never get to hear our tongue, right? We hear English, we hear French, we hear all of the derivations of the colonial, the, of the people that colonized our, the continent. But to have that moment where you actually get to hear Yoruba, you don't know what it is, but you can feel it. Mm -hmm. And that's what, and it happens all the time. The opera, it's perfect, it's all in Italian. What the hell are they saying? I don't know, but I love it, and, I, and I'm a subscription holder, so. And, you know, I think it's just going off of that, too, and like all these different things that we're saying about connectivity between places, it's that, you know, like one of the really interesting things, in, in the script, the way that the language is written out to guide the actors is phonetically so they can they can hear it. But the Yoruba language is a tonal language. And so when we think about the way language is spoken and then a language that gets stripped away but then gets pushed into other things like music, 
right? So suddenly there's like a new vocab, like, like the music has taken over the vocabulary of the voice and that's something that has pulsed through time, right? So that even someone as a tap, I mean a tap dancer, the evolution of that form of dance is all connected to those rhythms. So the things that he's speaking are the rhythms that we feel ins inside of us. It's our pulse, it's like the way we understand breath and who we are. So even without, even without the words, I think that was the intent probably of having yeah. him speak and it wasn't projected. Exactly, so exactly. And, you, and the sense that this person, there's a truth to him that is connecting to the truth of the, of the father, you know what I mean? Yeah. I should just add that, of course, the play was written partly in Spanish and uh, Brazilian Portuguese, and, they would, and that bit was translated. Um, but so there were many languages uh, involved in, in the play. Yeah, I was just going to echo what they were, what they uh, both talked about in terms of. Uh, for me, the the flash point was the uh, the white bubble lab. I was in Cuba yesterday, and I <laughs> went to a rumba ceremony, and half of the dancers were white. <laughs> and I walked in, and I was really shocked. But it was momentary because it was so everything just gelled. It was like I saw that for a minute. And it and afterwards, I did ask one of the the uh, performers. I said, "Oh, how did you come to do it?" And he said, "Oh, a British guy too." And he said, "Oh, I just took a million and one classes. That's all, you know." Um, but they, it was with so much ease and uh, just a communication between you know all of it. And I it was really impressive for me. And I really actually liked that about the uh, ceremony that they were really that the language of the dances and the culture and was the, sort of transcended all of that, right? Which you don't see here as much, which is, I, I think was beautiful for me. And seeing it there, just sort of, again, with the white guy, just sort of brought it alive. And, and not to say that sometimes that is not, that is problematic, right? Like it's not, and what was great about that scene was everybody had a different reaction, you know? And ultimately, the blessing was recognized by the fa the fa the elder, and that's what really mattered. But to s that dynamic is, can be troublesome. It's not all gravy. Um, I just wanted to to add that uh, many of the people I've talked to over the years, one of the things they talk about is how Africa is colonizing everybody, and how in fact the powers are being inverted through the spiritual paradigm, and within the spiritual paradigm. Everyone comes to the sources of knowledge who are usually black folks and they're bowing down to these sources of knowledge because they recognize that this transcendent sphere, this kind of other articulate, this other knowledge is something that they need. Like the young man, the man who needed the, the instruction from Yemen Ja to go get his biofuel wealth, you know, that they're understanding that there's something else that they're gaining. And so they're willing to forget or you know, they transcend their eth ethnicities and their, their colors in order to kind of um, bow to what Africa has given the world. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, actually, I'm a Yoruba person, so I grew up in Nigeria. So I really enjoy the play, so I like the culture and the tradition that it portrays, and then the links between the Orishas, the Yemoja, the Oshun. And I think uh, one thing that, I mean, that was missing, like uh, we didn't see, I mean, uh, Ogun, I mean, which is a very important uh, Orisha in Yoruba land uh, as one of the, I mean, characters there. And uh, also towards the end, I think uh, uh, instead of Babalawo, you know, revealing something or, I mean, it should have been uh, Romila. Uh, so, because uh, he's the grand uh, priest. So, and, uh, and I, I think uh, another scene, maybe in the play, like uh, uh, Kola not also play important role in Yoruba land. And I think uh, maybe that one could have also set certain stage, uh, maybe uh, when you are talking about Ori, for example, so uh, Kola Not will have been an important symbol that can be used so in that regard. 
So, so I really enjoy it. I think it's really good. But it's so many difficult choices to make because there were. Uh, uh, but I agree that uh, uh, Ogun was is, is a very Im important deity to. But I think uh, that there's also think. something to be said for breaking from tradition because you're right. You're absolutely right, and I think that's the that when you start to link the tradition with theater, um, and especially I don't know the playwrights, but a lot of first generation have one step removed from the tradition tradition. So they may not throw kola nut, but they, but they understand who's the Orisha for their head. And I think it's important to start telling also first generation stories of how their culture got translated through their other, their, that third experience. So you're absolutely correct about the symbols and the way the tradition is traditionally practiced. I also want to add that there is something very exciting about the modernity of the transatlantic translation of tradition. And of course, to focus on the women, I mean, that was a decision that all the writers made, that they would choose the three female, the strongest female de deities. I was excited to see the children here. I yes. think that was, I, I was just so sad to see them not here for the Q&A because they could have really given us an insight into their culture. In the uh, late 90s, I helped develop the New York City Board of Ed uh, Project Arts website. And one of the things that I tried to do and did was try and look at where the kids were coming from and what their interest was. And what was their interest but music, language, fashion, and sex. And, and so, uh, but a lot of their culture, especially the black kids, came from Africa. And they didn't know that. So one of the things that we were trying to do was show them their language and their music, that it came from there so they would have roots. Because many of, of us don't have roots, whether we're black or, or wherever. We come from some other place. I, and I loved your comments about uh, what I call experiential storytelling the nonlinear storytelling, because I, that really engaged me. And I love that it was in the middle, because we felt like we were not just we versus them. And I think that's one of the things that's there. Uh, the question is, how do you bring this to young people and revise it so that maybe they catch on and want to learn more about their culture? I mean, at National Black Theater, um, we do, I mean, we've done Orisha plays forever. Uh, I think the folklore of Orisha plays and indigenous cultural plays um, is it just lends itself to young people. Um, but our founder, my mother, Dr. Barbara Ann Tier, um, the point of putting on these kinds of productions were for, I mean, our our first ensemble, like the our opening company, were all teenagers. I mean, now they run the, the they run the show and they're elders. But it started out to give youth an identity in this country that gave them roots past um, their, their enslavement. I would like, oh, I'm sorry, maybe Frank, I like one of the really oh, yeah. quickly too. I think that, you know, I think the really interesting thing about a piece like this is because it's something that we, because it's something that we don't see very often, I think we're tempted to frame it as something outside of ourselves when it's not, when it's something that's very integral to who we are on every, on every level. So in terms of, um, I think, bringing young people in, bringing all audiences in, it's about just making the connection of who we are fundamentally as people rather than, you know, I always say this about Shakespeare, that people say, oh, they feel like it's something outside of themselves. It's not outside of you. It's talking about something very essential to human nature. And I feel like that's the thing that this play captures too it's like what is the how how is it can how is how, how what's the way that we're all connected not that we have to reach outside of ourselves to access something how does it affect us at our core you know I would like to ask you sorry mm -hmm. but one of the uh, one of our actors how did it maybe come a bit closer here and uh, um, you Chen can give you a mic but how did it feel oh, uh, uh, to to be asked to be in the play what did you expect and what came out of it and so what was your experience yeah, um, actually <laughs> I'm gonna try not to cry. So, it's uh, it was very emotional for me and um, surprising because I have been in Washington State actually doing a teaching artist residency out there, and I have a two-month gap. So I came to New York 
And then I think the day after I landed, I got an email <laughs> from Aoye, like, would you like to be in this reading? I got your contact from uh, Chinire Anyangwu, who is a really phenomenal casting director who really um, does a great job of staying in touch with actors of African descent, usually first generation uh, African American. And um, it's been emotional for me because, uh, first of all, I'm sitting in this room <laughs> and I think for the first time in my life, I'm realizing that, um, well, I'm Yoruba and I'm first generation Nigerian American. And growing up, I grew up in New York City and I would meet people who were um, first generation Caribbean American, first generation uh, Puerto Rican American, first generation uh, Dominican American. And I always felt some sort of tie to them, but I never knew exactly what it was. And now I'm 30, I'm gonna turn 31 on Wednesday. And just being back in New York and specifically being in this room, I'm seeing people who are from St. Vincent and I see the Yoruba in them, um, Haiti and I see the Yoruba in them and uh, Trinidad and I see the Yoruba in them. And it's like, whoa, the Yoruba is, most people, there's a lot of people who are Yoruba, you know, it's not just Nigeria anymore. It's, so now I feel like, okay, I've got these cousins um, across the world. And that's why all these years they've been somewhat speaking to me spiritually. Um, it, it's also emotional for me because when I finished reading the script, I was reminded of a, rom a romantic relationship that I was in. Uh, it was my first relationship, and it was with um, a man who was uh, Igbo American, and he was a little bit older than me, and he practiced capoeira. And so he would tell me these things about Ifa, and I didn't know anything about Ifa. My parents uh, raised me Christian. My father was Muslim. There are a lot of Muslims in Nigeria, and usually people who go uh, down that path choose to, um, well, I can't even say it's a choice because of the type of schools they go to. They're not encouraged to uh, embrace Ifa. They basically have to cut it off. And they still are Nigerian and they're proud, but they, they, the religious aspect is cut off. So being in that relationship, it, it, um, it, it made me open my eyes um, and sort of reconnect with Yoruba heritage um, and so this play reminded me of that reconnection and how important it is for me um, to hold on to that, uh, especially now that I'm coming into a time in my life where I'm thinking about family and what am I going to pass down to my children? Are they going to be watered down? Or Because <laughs> I know I'm already watered down, and I don't want them to water down anymore. So it's been very crucial for me, not just as an artist, but personally to be a part of this reading. And I really do hope that it becomes a production here in the US. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, um, I think that was a, a, a wonderful, I think, uh, a moment to uh, uh, like keep in the, in the room, you know, and think about it and approach it, but I think, uh, I would like to thank you all for coming. Also, you know, thank you so much for um, uh, Shadi for for joining us again. Avoy, this is uh, remarkable, and at least to have the vision with the writers to create something. It's an experiment. You never know how do things work out. Do they come out as a? It's very courageous. And I think you found something in there, and it is really our hope that it works uh, out. So perhaps if you know people um, and who are in the position to make decisions, you know, tell about the story or. Uh, Maybe some of you do your own work or, you know, include it, whatever it is. But I think uh, this was a remarkable evening. I'm so honored and proud that we could do this here at the Siegel Center. I was this summer in Sao Paulo and I saw the Afro-Brazilian Museum. And you had told me about the uh, the play. And I, it was such a world, some, something that spoke to me and said, we now finally should do it. And uh, I'm, I'm really, really honored. Also, thanks and for answering. Said, I said, no, it's not possible. Yeah, she said, Frank, forget about it. You can't do this. I said, Stop I music, dance. Yeah, How can yeah. you do it as a reading? And I said, that's a good reason to say, yes, we can. But uh, <laughs> And uh, so we went back and forth. And uh, and she said, but you have to watch the DVD at least, yes. <laughs> but I also want to thank Anche for helping us to make that happen and uh, to everybody. So thank you. And join us for a little reception. Thank you.